All right. Uh, welcome to a special podcast focused on Slavoj Žižek's For They Know Not What They Do. I'm here with Michael Downs and David McCarricker of Theory Underground. And this podcast is going to be a really, I think, special treat to pick the mind um, of both uh, Michael and Dave on this specific book, which is an early text in Slavoj Žižek's career. Um, perhaps also an overlooked text in uh, Slavoj Žižek's career. Uh, most people will go to the sublime object of ideology for his earliest works. Um, and for they know not what they do um, often gets overlooked. And that's something that I think Theory Underground um, is trying to change um, because starting on February 25th, uh, and there'll be a link in the description, um, Theory Underground will be launching a course on For They Know Not What They Do, led by Michael Downs. Um, and I think it's correct to say, hystericized by David McCarricker. Yep. And, um, and so, so this is just a preview uh, of, of hopefully some of the deeper conversations that will emerge in the course and deeper reflections that will emerge in the course. So welcome, Michael. Welcome, Dave. Uh, and uh, why don't you why don't you just introduce yourselves, introduce a little bit of background on the course, Theory Underground, how you guys relate to each other in the courses or how you're you know aiming to relate to each other and uh, get the ball rolling there. Dave, why don't you start off? Cool. Yeah. Well, the two of us met on Facebook in a philosophy group like seven or eight years ago and struck up conversation. Well, it might be more. Are, are we approaching 10 years almost? Fuck, man. Yeah, probably. It's, it's, we're going back a while now. Yeah. And we, you know, uh, Mikey made a post about uh, on his blog about uh, McLuhan and Levinas on the phone. And the, the whole thing is like a critical media theory perspective on the value of voice messaging as well as live phone calls, as opposed to letters, as opposed to uh, uh, other ways of communicating. There's something special about the voice, something that can be conveyed in the voice that can't be conveyed elsewhere for a friendship. I mean, obviously the voice of an author comes through and reading a book is so important because there's a kind of voice there as well. But uh, my point is that our friendship comes out of voice messaging on Facebook Messenger back when there was still a cool philosophy group in existence on Facebook. Oh, wait, that's not a diss, by the way, because you have one. You, you've got a great one. Philosophy Portal is awesome. We just didn't know about it until very recently. And so all I want to say about that is that uh, Mikey one day told me to go talk about this book I would, I'd been talking about. He said, turn on a camera, talk about that book, put it on YouTube. You need to just go do it. And uh, so I started doing theory plebe stuff. That's what Theory Underground used to be called. But I had a bunch of reasons for wanting to change the name. And I got Mikey to start the Dangerous Maybe blog, which is going... It's uh, Dave's fault. He peer pressured me into it. Yeah, and it's going platinum in the age of Napster in the blogging world, which is, <laughs> you know, an analogy for saying that, you know, at the time when blogging is out of vogue, his is blowing up and people go to it because it's not just topical. Oh, I draw off of Nietzsche to talk about this film. Oh, I talk about Bad Dude to talk about this show. There is that. But more importantly, there are these, for all practical purposes, short books being published on the blog that deal with specific concepts that get exchanged around the interwebs without usually being unpacked. We call them black boxes, right? That's a term that Bruno Latour uses when he talks about them. But, you know, a black box is when you keep talking about objet ah and body without organs and difference and all of these other being in the world, Dasein, you know, transcendental subjectivity, all these concepts without ever breaking down what you mean um, and doing so without constant reference to um, other thinkers, other ideas, other concepts, other jargon, 
Um, and so the Mikey standard, as we've coined it, is to talk about a concept without constantly referring it to these other ones while flushing out how it applies in a variety of different examples. And uh, the other piece of the puzzle that we've uh, recently realized is a part of our criteria for excellence is you can't just say things are similar. That's the dead end. That's a thought terminating cliche to say, oh, well, this is similar to this thing that Deleuze does. Talk about why it's different, right? Don't just compare. You've got to contrast. And so we have this standard, though, because we're working class dropout people, you know, like we both are GED graduates. Um, you know, we did, you know, in Mikey's case, he didn't finish high school. In my case, I didn't attend. And uh, so, you know, Theory Underground is relatively new. It's only been around for a few months. And the, the kind of description or about what what the group what what it actually is as a entity has I'm, I've been trying to articulate it in different ways and my my most recent one is theory underground is by and for working class thinkers dropouts and autodidacts who don't belong anywhere. So that's my introduction. Thank you for having us on here. Yeah. So I'm uh, Michael Downs, the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. Um, been doing the blog for about four years now, I think. And like we said, Dave is the one who motivated me to start doing it. I was always posting long posts on Facebook or whatever. And um, it just kind of got to the point where they were getting too long to post on Facebook. And Dave, and then I, one of my other friends, Christian Pointer, he's always been one of my big supporters. He's like, you got to do something, do YouTube videos you know, do a blog, whatever, but Dave's the one who, who peer pressured me into finally doing it. And it's been, it's been awesome. Um, and, and the blog's been far more successful than I thought it would be. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, what they call the Mikey standard, it's just, I've always felt like if I'm talking about philosophy and I can't explain it to the guys I grew up with in Raytown, Missouri is where I'm from. If I can't explain it to my Raytown homies <laughs> then i don't i don't know what i'm talking about and uh okay where did, where what did i drop out you're you're good you're good it was just frozen for a sec there but your audio is all okay. clear okay and you're you're back you're back cool um yeah if i if i i feel like i'm talking about a concept but i can't explain it to the guys i grew up with who aren't into philosophy or theory or anything then i just feel like i'm bullshitting so i always I knew that if I could see the lights come on with them, where they started being able to recognize things in their own life through OJA or um, Dasein or Dasmon or the big other, whatever, that I'm like, okay, then they, because they're seeing it too, right? Even though they're not philosophers, even though they're not theorists, if they get a concept and they understand it clearly enough, if they start seeing how it's operative in their life, then in a way it's like, yeah, there's a kind of confirmation that they're seeing what I'm seeing too. And so I've always held myself to that standard. Now it's very popular when people start doing YouTube videos and blogs to be like, I'm doing this to make theory accessible and clear to everybody. Right. But I mean, I, the, I've, I've just always been trying to do that. And um, I mean, that's why, you know, someone like Todd McGowan, I, I love his work so much is that, Todd's this great Lacanian Hegelian scholar, but he's able to make the theory so crystal clear that anybody can get it. And so I, it's just, that's something I've always respected. And I think all of these ideas from all of these thinkers, even the ones I disagree with, are so good and so important that it's kind of a shame that they're locked behind these walls of jargon. And I, it's almost like, I don't, the funny thing is it's like, Oh, they, they, they wrote in this way to protect themselves from criticism. Like somebody, if it was too intelligible, somebody might be able to launch a powerful critique. Thing is, I think the concepts are so good that they don't need that kind of protection. They're able to stand up to scrutiny, whether, whether we're talking about Lacan's concepts or Deleuze and Guattari or Heidegger or Marx, or like, or, or Derrida, like, even if you disagree with them or, or, or Hegel's concepts, even if you disagree, these are incredible conceptual tools 
And I, 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 there's a lot of merit to every one of these concepts. And there's just no reason for them to be so inaccessible to people. And so I'm really happy to see a lot of other young thinkers popping up who are sick of the bullshit too, sick of like them, th th all of this being inaccessible. And so I see a lot of people, um, what Dave and I call underground theorists, who are starting to develop this more into a subculture than it is just academic research, right? And that's what it is for Dave and I. Like philosophy for us, theory for us, is not just some academic activity that's about producing essays and getting published in journals. Like I put Zizek with Tupac and, and Bob Dylan, like and with Mozart and Beethoven, with Miles Davis. Like for me, theory is combined with pop culture, classical music, um, hip hop. Uh, like I can't untangle them. And so that's, that's the thing. When philosophy works its way into your everyday life, it's not just an abstract exercise. It's part of your life world to talk like Husserl. And, you know, Zizek and Baudrillard and Marx are as much a part of my life as Judas Priest and Tupac and, you know, Eminem, whoever, right? Like, so that's where more and more you see th this, this thing with theory on the internet becoming more of a subculture. And I'm happy about that. Like, I'm really happy about it. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic movement. And actually, I mean, I think the reason I initially started getting back into YouTubing, um, specifically in in philosophical direction, was because there wasn't enough space at the university to contain my curiosity and interest, quite frankly. So, so I was like, okay, so where do I put myself? I, I'm not, I, you know, my, let's say my excess doesn't fit here. You know where where is it where is it going to fit and uh, you know YouTube and I think blogging and and other other outlets become become a home for that and I think the internet also is opening up um, a totally new culture and and certainly all of these uh, philosophical texts which were uh, you know previously um, only really accessible if you were attending a major Ivy League school or something like that not so you're long lucky ago if they were there even at that place like even if they were there. Yeah. I mean, you could go to Harvard. Good luck getting a, a really great course on Deleuze's difference in repetition. Like, even now, I don't know if you can get that at a place like that. So, you know, and that, so that was always my attitude was the, you know, universities getting in the way of my education. And right. So, I mean, I, I, I took some uh, courses at community college and they were incredibly formative because I had the greatest philosophy teacher anybody could ever hope to have. His name's Doug Washer. And he taught at Longview Community College for 30 or 40 years, something like that. And shout out to, to Doug. Day, yeah, big shout out to Doug. Uh, I, to this day, I've never seen somebody be able to light up a room while explaining philosophy like Doug. He was everyone's favorite teacher they had while at Longview. He won all kinds of teaching awards because I mean, you can take any different type of student from any type of background, and he can make them love philosophy as long, at least while in his classroom, they like philosophy. I'm not saying they'd want to go read Kant after afterwards, but uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it was just this, uh, this charismatic ability he had as a teacher to make philosophy so fun, so funny, so entertaining. And I'm not naturally half as funny as Doug is, so I don't have that, but I learned a lot from him on how to re make philosophy relatable to people, not just accessible. Like that's a, right. There's a difference, I guess, between making theory accessible and making it relatable. Like accessible just means, okay, they understand it. It's clearly understood, but relatable means I, not only do I understand it, I see how it connects to my life. And I want more of that because it shows me things about my own life. And I guess that that's even even more so than trying to make it accessible. Dave and I are always trying to make it relatable. I want to use an well, example then. quick just to say that, you know, obviously once you kind of formalize the idea that there is this standard that we can hold ourselves to, um, obviously you start seeing that other people are not, you know, trying to live up to that standard. And so you start evaluating speech and discourse and teaching and books on that 
basis, and maybe that's not always the right criterion to judge something by. That's not what, you know, usually what, when we're dealing with a primary text, that's not what they're doing, right? And so we can't use that standard on them. It's a standard that you should be bringing to a secondary text or an introductory text or videos that are purporting to do that or speak to working people or, or whatever. But um, once you've kind of taken this standard seriously and you start trying to, you know, test yourself with it, um, it gets really fun. And uh, I think most people want to live the exam in life. I think that most people just don't like philosophy because of all these stereotypes and experiences they might've had. But, and, and to, to be fair, a lot of those are legit. The problem is um, something like jouissance or, or being in the world, that is your reality. Like that is going to help you understand your situation so much better to actually have that broken down. And uh, so finding relatable ways of talking about jouissance has been one of my favorites. Um, you know, being, you know, distinguishing between pleasure and enjoyment and saying that enjoyment is a technical term and that I can't use it in this way that means pleasure and, 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 and then getting into how, you know, we, we constantly rationalize how everything we're doing is, you know, for, for our, for our best interest or, or, or for our pleasure or for, you know, it's whatever it is, maybe we're getting really upset and, and we're in traffic and we're honking on the horn and, or, or we're really just having our day seemingly ruined by the fact that other people are driving the way they're driving. We have this rational ideological sort of standard that we've kind of imposed on the situation to make sense of why we are acting out this way. And, and uh, you know, we think, well, if everyone else would drive correctly, then I would be I would be happy. I would be fulfilled. I would be a harmonious pleasure would be achieved. And so this is the rationality and, uh, you know, the, 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 it's that sort of liberal subject. We're, we're rational actors seeking our pleasure to maximize it, et cetera. Well, the point is once you start seeing that jouissance is in everything, then you go, Oh shit. We like to get in our own way. We like to get in the way of our own pleasure in fact, our unconscious is constantly trying to seek out these ways to give ourselves trouble, to give ourselves grief, to be stressed out, to feel this intensity, to feel this exhilaration in hating that person in traffic or whatever. And then once you realize that this is death drive operative in the traffic jam, you might not stop, you know, enjoying the way that you enjoy. Um, you might not stop tailgating or going the speed limit, right? Because some people, they get their enjoyment from following the rules very strictly and going the speed limit, even when everyone else is going 10 over. But then you get that other person who's like, it's the opposite, right? And that's why they're tailgating and slamming on their brakes and skirting around, even though they're not going to get anywhere any faster, right? So on both sides of this debate, it's not really a debate, but on both sides of this example with the traffic jam, you've got people who's they rationally think, oh, but this is because I'm a pleasure-seeking person and these other people are fucking idiots. They're ruining everything for me. But jouissance helps you get like that critical distance and go, oh, I'm not just a pleasure-seeking creature. I also get enjoyment from this kind of drama that I've been creating for myself with this narrative that I'm a rational pleasure-seeking creature. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've, uh, I've gotten... Uh, my fiance's father to, re to like it, it unlocked for him. Uh, we were talking for 15 minutes about jouissance and then he started applying it to his own work life balance with how he takes on certain projects and then he doesn't get them done before the weekend and he spends all weekend stressing out about it and all of this other stuff. And, and he starts applying it to all these different things. And I found out this same weekend when I had that conversation, uh, my fiance had been talking to her sister kind of doing the same thing, talking about their, you know, their cleanliness disputes and all of this other stuff. And so anyway, it's really cool to see it unlocking for somebody who's never looked into theory before. And they go, damn, I didn't realize this. And then obviously, as they go on through life, they're going to be like, wow, this is really helping me live an examined life. And we're over here being like, yeah, see, philosophy is cool. We can make it relatable. Well, I, I, I've had some some experience um, trying to sort of connect um, the depths of you know depths of philosophy to, to, to everyday life, but 
you know, often, oftentimes there's a, I've experienced a type of um, negativity or, or negative reaction. There's this, there's this funny meme of uh, two bears awkwardly holding hands and walking home. And there's a, a line above it that says, uh, another date ruined by philosophy. You know, it's like, you know, bringing philosophy to a first date and it's like, oh, no, 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 no we have to, how, how are we, how are we going to get, but no, I, I think, I think there are, there are, of course, uh, you know, people who uh, um, are, are, are welcoming that, that, that philosophical in, in, intrusion. And uh, I, I liked your, your definition there, Dave, of uh, uh, theory underground as a uh, buy-in for working class thinkers, autodidacts, and people who don't belong anywhere. And and, and reach it, reaching those people who who don't mind being uh, let's say uh, intruded upon by by philosophy and and in this in this in the spirit of uh, shouting out our uh, community college professors that left a profound impact on us I'm going to shout out uh, Dave O'Brien who I guess had the same uh, function for me as a as a as a Mikey had there in community college Hello, and, and in that spirit the, the question I'll throw out to you guys is you know where did your original interest in philosophy come from I mean what's what's your background you know what 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 when when did the uh, philosophical light bulb pop on I'll say that you want to go Dave Mikey I know you're gonna refrain from doing your story but the I when we got told it the other day when we got you to tell it the other day, though, we didn't realize that that was for the behind the patron wall side of the Zizek and so on podcast. We thought it was on the public side when we did it. And so you still have to do it on the public side of the Internet. So while I let you sit with what I just said, because you have to decide whether you're going to actually unpack it or not, I'll do mine. OK, so I was 23 years old when I decided to go to college. I had been a dropout and a fuck up. Now, I wasn't a dropout of high school. I was a runaway from homeschool, you know, which is different. And, you know, I love my parents now. I think we've got a pretty good relationship compared to a lot of people. But at the time, I really did not jive so well with their uh, desire to be secluded from the world to essentially raise us as good little Christians. And, um, I think the, the, the religious question has always been one that vexes me. And I'm not going to get too much into it right now, except to say that um, I don't know if it, I, I could be considered spiritual by some people's standards. I'm definitely an atheist by some people's standards. If I have to say what my own standard is, it doesn't, I'm communicating to other people. So it's like, well, I really just have to clarify my terms. I am definitely an atheist concerning uh, that God, <laughs> the one I grew up being told was real. But um, as far as everything else goes, I think I'm way too epistemologically um, skeptical and also open-minded to, to go too far down the definitive, you know, strong, committed take making path, uh, which is to say that, you know, uh, almost anything's possible, right? Like uh, there are, probably other dimensions to reality. There's likely a multiverse. Uh, even if there's not, the universe itself is too big to comprehend. Uh, you know, it goes on and on forever. And so, um, you know, I think this is why we have to take Kant seriously. Like uh, the, and, and why I ve am very skeptical about anyone who's really hasty to make dogmatic assertions about presuppositions that entail too many commitments, so many commitments that it limits my ability to think for myself. And so I'm not just saying, oh, I'm a free thinker. I'm, I'm also aware, though, that there is a supreme value to taking on a standpoint and having a resolute commitment to a standpoint. Uh, from Heidegger's position, it's this, you know, there's a resolute stand that you can take on your facticity, your horizon of possibilities. And from Baudu's, it would be a resolute commitment to an event, some event that was transformative for you. But my event that was transformative for me and what I take a resolute stand on in terms of my facticity is the realization that ideology, though it might be necessary, is not capable of, uh, on its own, allowing me to live an examined life or have serious thoroughgoing uh, conversations with other people. And I often think that it's harming other people or making other people want to harm other people in my life. 
And so ideology is suspect for me. And the three major forms of ideology, I'm still ideological, no doubt. But the three major forms of ideological influence that is formative for subjectivity for all of us today are going to be, broadly speaking, capital, the state, and the church, secular or religious. And I say it that way because I would say that the school is always going to be somewhere on the secular or religious side of the divide, but that the school and the church kind of serve, serve similar functions in a lot of cases today. And um, regardless of whether you're left, right, center, independent, whatever, it's beneficial for anyone to spend a period of time in their life suspending presuppositions and thinking through things. And so though my, my skeptical um, anti-dogmatic position is itself dogmatic, I think that because it's so marginalized by those other three uh, influences over ideology, I think that it has something to offer. I think it is worth committing myself to. And so the goal of Theory Underground is not to indoctrinate everyone to become good little leftists or, or whatever, but it's instead to get people to enter a space where uncertainty is okay, uh, ideological differences are allowed, and we're more interested in reading and rereading fundamental and essential texts to living the examined life then we are in ever pushing through some series of issues. And everyone has their issues, but we try to leave those out of things and just deal with the most profound and difficult thinkers from the history of philosophy, and, and we stick to that. And so that's what I appreciate, appreciate about philosophy portal is I think there's a lot of um, a sort of synergy between right our positions here as far as seeing up a supreme value in understanding these thinkers on their own terms to the best of our ability. Absolutely. So, Mike, Mikey, are you, are you, are you up? Are you up for the, for, for, for a retelling? All right, so, all right. Just so for Dave. All right. This will be the third time I tell this story. I, I said it to on one of your streams, Dave, I've said it on Zizek and so on podcast. And now I'll say it here, but I'm about running out. <laughs> this will probably be the last time I told the story. Okay. So my I got my whole thing with becoming hooked on philosophy was somewhat cinematic. It almost sounds like a, something you see in a movie. It was weird. So for my whole life, I had been really just a mall rat. I was a happy little consumer. Um, but I was also raised a, a Christian. Um one of my family members was a major Christian fundamentalist. And so I'd been getting that since I was a kid. And by the time I was 21, I, 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 it was on my 21st birthday. It hit like lightning. I woke up on my 21st birthday with this realization, like, okay, I'm an adult. I've never really thought much about anything, or I've never really examined. I didn't even know to call them presuppositions at that, but I, I didn't, I never examined what I actually believe or figured it out. And I knew that I had stuff with religion to work through. I had stuff with politics to work through, um, cultural stuff. And so I figured, well, if you're going to start thinking about deep things, well, you go to philosophy. And at that time, the only philosopher I'd ever heard of was Socrates. And so I, uh, I had some birthday money. And so I was like, I'm going to go buy some philosophy books. And so I go to Barnes and Noble and I'm looking around the philosophy section and I'm, I'm starting to get more and more pissed off at Barnes and Noble because they don't have any Socrates books. And um, I'm like, well, you know, how the hell you got all this, you got a philosophy section, but you don't have any books by the greatest philosopher that ever lived. What a bunch of fucking bullshit. So I go over to customer service and I'm like, hey, um, why don't you guys have any Socrates books? Uh, do I have to order them or something? And the guy was nice enough to tell me about the whole Socrates-Plato connection. And that, uh, yes, there are Socrates books. It's just that Socrates didn't write them. And uh, he's a character in Plato's dialogues. And so we went back over to the section and he started showing me the Republic and then some of the other dialogues. And so 
I bought some Play-Doh and also he told me about Descartes meditations and I thought that sounded cool. So I got those, I got Play-Doh and Descartes, went home, thought I was just going to sit down and start reading, just sit down and absorb them. Oh, was I fucking wrong about that? So you got to remember at this time, I, I had, I didn't make it through high school. I did get my GD, but at 21, I was basically functionally illiterate. Like, yeah, of course I could read in to some degree, but I couldn't read a newspaper and understand what the hell was going on in the politics sec, sec, uh, section or anything like that. <clears throat> and so I go from basically never reading to wanting to read Plato and Descartes. And so the weird thing is, though, I, I started I started trying to understand them, couldn't understand a goddamn word in those books. And yet something in me got attached, like my, somehow my drive got hooked on studying philosophy and purely by accident, one of the conscious choice, I just found myself going back to these books every single day. And I would start spending hours and hours. And I started looking up words in the dictionary because it wasn't even about understanding technical terms. I was not going to understand platonic forms at that point. I had to just understand basic words that I didn't know. So I got hooked on studying these books around this time i also went out to another bookstore borders which became my home away from home during this early period because i met two people there who became good friends of mine and they were the first artsy intellectual people i'd ever really met and i go in there and i'm hungry to know about philosophy and stuff and they're like oh shit well let me tell you about it so they, they so they get me Sartre and they get me Kant and they get me Nietzsche and they get me Kierkegaard and they, you know so it started building from there and then they started showing me about art and expanding my my uh range of music options and everything I, I never heard of Tom Waits I never really listened to Bob Dylan like all that like I was a 90s kid I just cared about rap so uh they got they they opened up the whole world for me and so through this whole process i end up getting hooked on studying philosophy and it just became a kind of obsession where i would spend like eight hours a day doing this and back then i you know i worked for the family business and so i had a lot more time than most people do and so i could devote a lot of time each day to studying philosophy and once i then i discovered oh there's actually commentaries written on the, these books like there are commentaries written on the bible and so i started ordering the secondary material and the commentaries and they started connecting dots and everything so from 21 to 27 that's that was my passion that's what i wanted to do was just figure out philosophy i never thought i was going to do a goddamn thing with it i just wanted to learn more about it well at 27 my best friend noke his name's ronnie but we his nickname is noke Note comes to me. He's like, dude, last year I took this philosophy class out at Longview. You have got to go take a class with this one guy. And I'm like, no, I didn't graduate high school. I'm not going to a fucking college. What are you talking about? He's like, oh, Kerry, you can audit it. You can just take the one course. I don't give a shit. Just go sit in this dude's class. Like, you don't even have to do the homework. Just take the class, audit it, whatever you got to do. You need to meet this guy. And so I blew him off for a couple semesters. And then he finally, convinced me to go take a, a class with Doug Washer and me and Doug just instantly clicked. And I was like, holy shit, this dude can really help me understand all these books. I, I, you got to realize I was so far from anything academic that, yeah, to me, it was kind of news like, Hey, I can go here and this guy can help me understand these books. <laughs> and so uh, um, Doug and I just became great friends. He became a great mentor. We're, we're you know, I love him to death. And he really changed my life. But the thing with Doug was his interest in philosophy was on different thinkers than who, who I was specifically interested in. But it was through him, like Doug, like he was kind of like a, a drill sergeant uh, making me read like the history. Like he had me reading Aristotle's metaphysics and the categories and the, the Nicomachean ethics. And he had me reading John Stuart Mill and David Hume and Leibniz and Wittgenstein and Bertrand Russell and Charles Sanders Peirce and Whitehead and like Husserl. He had me reading all this stuff and he was, he was helping me. Like we would meet after class or we would meet a couple of times a week and he would tutor me. And so he 
like was so instrumental. Like I got more of an education from Doug just helping me on the side than I would have actually going to school because I, you know, I'd spend a couple hours with them a few times a week and we'd read through books or he would explain basic concepts, concepts to me. And I got more of a philosophy education from just doing that and not really going to school than I would have if I was going to school full time. And so in a weird way, yeah, go ahead. I just want to throw in there that he also put you to, to work uh, mentoring, which was probably a huge part of your yeah, so Doug, Doug had me tutor for a couple of years. And that's, that was another thing where he also, he's like, look, if you really want to understand this stuff, you need to teach it. And so the first public lecture I ever gave was I, you know, I guest lectured in his class a few times on Kierkegaard. Um, and he would, he would let me do other little guest lectures here or there, or whatever. And it, it, he would have me, like I was tutoring students in, you know, logic teaching them venn diagrams and then teaching them basic existentialism and teaching them kantian morality and all this stuff and so again it was just the more and it's funny i don't know how i haven't talked about this part of my history with philosophy as much as i'm doing here but no like it was such a concentrated robust philosophical education in the span of like two years because the thing is doug ended up retiring and so, and you got to realize through this whole thing. So I took, I took four classes that he taught. I took the four classes he taught. He taught introduction to philosophy. He taught logic, um, psychology, and ethics. So I took those four, but Doug was so cool. He still let me just go hang out in other, like he would teach philosophy intro, intro to philosophy again. He would teach ethics again. And I would just go sit, bum around the class and absorb more. So for two years, I just bummed around Doug's class and hung out with him. And it was a better philosophical education than money could buy. And, but, but, okay. But it also kind of abruptly ended when he decided to retire. And so I had to just take what I had learned from him and then apply it to other thinkers I hadn't learned. Cause again, Doug wasn't big on Baudrillard or Heidegger or Zizek or Lacan or Deleuze. And so I was on my own to figure those guys out. Um, but the tools he gave me, and that's the thing, like this background I got in the, the primary text of the history of philosophy, you know, people can hear me and Dave have a conversation about Zizek or Lacan and all they hear is the Zizek and Lacan. But like, I have this whole history I learned that is totally responsible in, in, directly or indirectly for me being able to understand what I'm the stuff I'm focused on now so again my my indebtedness to Doug is I mean philosophically infinite so he I mean I can't say enough about how much he changed changed my life but so from after that period I uh I got into all these other thinkers and it was almost like starting over because when you go from you know when you go to try to learn Heidegger on your own or Deleuze or Baudrillard, you feel like you're on your own, no matter how much philosophy you've read. But this is also when the internet philosophy stuff started to become accessible. So Hubert Dreyfus's lectures on Heidegger pop up, and then David Harvey's lectures on Marxist capital pop up. And then you get philosophical institutes like the New Center for Research and Practice, and you get GCAS and you get there's a whole and then you get the partially examined life which was at one point it was like the spot on Facebook to talk philosophy it really was and I met so many friends there that's where I met Dave right and so it, it's through this whole process that you know I was able to get where I'm at now with philosophy where I'm you know teaching and I'm writing books but it was definitely I mean it was an underground education in philosophy. And so from day one, starting with buying books at Barnes and Noble, or just getting to bum around Doug's class and not really pursuing a degree or anything, just hanging out and learning theory or hanging out in the, the philosophy discussion groups on Facebook. Um, all of that led to where I'm at. But I will say the number one thing that I had that that is really responsible, I had enough time and energy to really do detailed readings of the texts. And 
as important as everything else was, that is, I guess, it, it sucks that we don't have enough. That's why I love what Dave's doing with time energy. It sucks that more people don't have their time energy, but that's where you really get a, a great familiarity with these concepts and these texts is by reading them for yourself, pouring over them, going, reading them three, four times, underlining, taking notes, connecting dots, all of that. And that's, that's really what we're trying to facilitate with what we're doing, where we know people don't have time and energy to read this stuff the way they might want to, but how can we facilitate them getting the, the, the concepts and learning the, the text in a way where they're still going to have to do some on their own if they really want to get there. But we like, there's this famous line from Jay-Z where he's talking about dealing drugs, but he was like, like, I told you sell drugs. No, Hove did that. So hopefully you won't have to go through that. That's kind of what we're doing. We did that. So you don't have to go through that where, yes, of course, you're going to have to do, do some of the work, but we're trying to me, that's what a great teacher does. A great teacher is there to save you time on having to like, and that's what Doug did with so much of that shit. He saved me so much time and getting to understand Sartre and Husserl and Wittgenstein. And it's not that the teacher gives you all the answers or it's a definitive interpretation. It just, it's a time hack where you can get tapped into what's going on in these texts in a way that you couldn't without the help of a teacher. And that's why like Dave just wrote a really great blog post or article. Um, what's the name of it? It's the, the, why we need teachers. Is that it? Yeah, I should have had that pulled up here already and I should know it off the top of my head, but it's something about mastery and uh, I think it's mastery versus the sub the students supposed to know. And the, for anyone who's new to the, the phraseology here, like it's a play off of the subject supposed to know. And uh, I'll let you talk about it. Well, well yeah, I mean, I just the, want to make a point that we'll put, we'll put links in the description to both your uh, blog there, Dave, and uh, also the dangerous maybe blog. So if anyone's interested in checking those out, links are in the description. Uh, continue on there, Dave. Uh, or Mike. Well, I mean, yeah, so Dave, I, I love this inversion that he's doing here. But so the subject supposed to know is this concept from Lacanian psychoanalysis and it has to do with transference, at least the way that Lacan understands transference really beginning in seminar 11. And the subject supposed to know is where you attribute to another person or even maybe an institution, but usually another person, some sort of special knowledge about yourself. Like they have the secret to your desire, your unconscious, your unconscious. And so it, it's this kind of positioning, like, and this is what is essential for the work of psychoanalysis. If, if you go into analysis and you don't believe the psychoanalyst has some sort of special knowledge about the workings of your unconscious, you're not going to stay with it, right? You, you have to believe there's a special knowledge this person possesses about you and about your particular situation for you to do the work of analysis. The point is, this is a, this is, you're duping yourself. But Lacan also has this great thing, the non-duped error, saying if you're not duped, if you're not deceived, you're tricked. And so if you go into analysis and go, this person sitting across from me doesn't know anything about me and has nothing to give, you're in the truth, but you're also tricking yourself because believing that they have something special to know about you or to, to let you know about yourself is what actually enables you to learn something about yourself. And so Zizek's always pointing this out about how um, if you don't have the symbolic fiction, if you stand completely in the truth, you're more duped than somebody who believes the symbolic fiction. And so what Dave is doing here is it's like, okay, teachers are often, you got to kind of do this positioning of a teacher as the subject supposed to know. And I, I'm not really, I'm not opposed to this because here's the thing. There are, there's billions of people in the world. Like if you really try to act like you take everybody's words as seriously as you do some, everybody else's, it all just blurs together. Like you need to be able to go, this person has somebody, something special to teach me. And it's only through thinking that, that you actually will devote time to like 
working through what this person has to say. So like figures of like intellectual masters, Freud, Lacan, Hegel, Heidegger, Deleuze, right? What works about them is, and it can go wrong. People can just totally over-identify with them. They can do no wrong. They have it all figured out, the end, right? That's a problem. But in positioning them as an authority and saying, I'm going to spend time working on this, what you're actually supposed to end up doing is seeing their lack, how they don't have what you thought they had. But it was, but through wrestling and doing this, like with Hegel, this dialectical tearing with the negative, you come out the other side of it having gained something that you didn't have at the beginning. You just don't have what you thought you were going to get. And so what Dave is pointing out here is it's almost like become – an inverted relationship where teachers are now acting like their students are the stu students supposed to know. And the point that follows from this is that teachers feel like they aren't supposed to actually lecture. They're not supposed to give a kind of authoritative exegesis of texts anymore. That, and we see this more and more with online philosophical tragedy. Courses. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think this pedagogy is just i think it's terrible and i don't think you never they always students always walk away feeling like they didn't get anything at all from the class and it's because so many teachers now are like i don't want to position myself as a master or an authority figure or whatever and it's like no you need to do that for them so they can see how you lack and so finding out how you're inconsistent or how you lack actually enables them to think something new and take the theory or the ideas further right and so in not being willing to lecture or take up a kind of authoritative expert stance on especially philosophical texts, it, it's actually hurting students by acting like, oh, well, we're all equal and the student already knows what they're, they're just approaching the discourse from a different perspective and we all have something to contribute. Well, I'm sorry. I expect somebody who's read Hegel for 20 years to have more to say about it than somebody who's read it for 20 minutes. Right. And, and I don't see how that's controversial. Yeah, this, absolutely. You, you'll learn all of my hottest, most definitive takes are not actually controversial, except to like some fringe overrepresented voices on the internet. But that one in particular is uh, actually a bit more controversial than a lot of, in the sense that. I mean, you're kind of taking something that a lot of professors have thought of as a virtue or as radical and saying, no, you're not helping me. You're not helping anybody. And, uh, and that can be offensive, but, and I, it's one of those things where maybe it was overcorrect. You know, we had the stodgy old um, oblivious, professor stereotype from the 1950s. He thought that he was the universal subject. He'd never thought about his position in discourse, blah, blah, blah. And uh, David Graeber touches on this. I know that, you know, you met him in London and stuff like that, Cadell, which was really cool, but um, you were an anthropology student. And so he wrote this piece called Anthropology and the Professional Managerial Class, which is a little essay where he's talking about how um, the, that, stereotype of the old 1950s professor is you might find that guy somewhere in a university in the United States, like it's possible. But the tendency now, the overwhelming tendency is like these uber self-aware people who don't even want to talk or, or, or if they do, they're going to constantly, he, he, what does he call it? Uh, reflexive. They're, they're constantly reflexive, always turning everything into a narrative that's got a, anyway, whatever, we all get the point. It's a good little article. You ought to read it if you can. But um, I, I don't bring that up in the article, though. I should have, but it's already long enough. I brought in, though, uh, The Tyranny of Structuralistness by Joe Freeman, as well as uh, the organizing manual by Starhawk, who's like kind of a hippie radical, new left radical. She's been like one of the main organizer guru ladies for like 50 years in the more horizontalist anarchist kind of radical spaces across the United States. And, you know, people pay to go to her workshops and stuff like that. And uh, the reason I bring these people up is because with her, she's upfront about how these kind of rhizomatic organizing approaches 
are best for short-term ephemeral projects, which would be the opposite of long-term lasting projects, right? So obviously it's very beneficial or practical within capitalism where everything uh, is constantly on the move, right? And you can't really bank on things being there in the future. But as far as like larger scale kinds of projects, maybe these ephemeral horizontalist non-leader kind of uh, projects are insufficient, you know, to the task. And then that's where I bring in Joe Freeman with her critique of the, uh, the it's called the tyranny of structurelessness. And she's saying, there's no such thing as a structureless social grouping. What you always have is organic structures. And like, and she uses the word organic, which she means is like naturally occurring. She's not against them. The point is you have people with more magnetic personalities, and you have people with shared interests or values within the group and those cluster, and you can call those cliques. She calls them elites, you know, it's her own jargon, but basically little cliques form. And she says that the the role of an institution or of a, of a formal structure in an organization is to mediate the, uh, between the interests of these different groups, not to crush them out of existence. It's to say like, Oh, Mikey and Dave and Kendell, they're always hanging out. And then we've got these other people who are always hanging out. We're all part of the same team, right? But there's these little groups. Okay, the formal structure is supposed to make it so that there's not a tyranny of structurelessness, which obviously there's always the organic structure. The point is, is those take over when there's no formal structure whatsoever. And I make the point that, you know, this 1960s kind of vision of radical horizontality um, and of, you know, flipping the classroom and getting rid of the lecture, um, it falls prey to this exact same principle of, you know, this tyranny of structurelessness because uh, the professor in that situation who's disavowing the position of subject supposed to know still is in that position because everyone still looks to the professor. So unconsciously, like that professor is still in that position. You don't get to just step out of it. Um, uh, but now you're not letting us get duped and you're not playing the role. You're not performing it. And by not performing it, you're not coming as prepared. And now we're not coming as prepared. And so the standards are just going whoosh, lowered through the floor. Yeah, so, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. And, um, you know, just to sort of maybe reflect a little bit on, on, on these two stories that, that, that have emerged on your origins there. Um, you know, I think there's so much value you know, in, in Mikey sharing that story. So thank you for sharing um, about your experience with, with Doug, um, because it shows how important transference is in, a, in an education. And a lot of the times, you know, in the modern institution, it's just that we're trying to defend against the reality of transference. We're trying to create a situations where transference doesn't occur. Um, and, and those situations don't, don't materialize. And I, and I think that that's, you know, um, it's a huge disservice to students who never end up developing that type of bond that, that you might've developed with Doug or that I developed with Dave O'Brien or a few other professors who, you know, throughout my time at the university, I, I wouldn't have made it through the university without those relationships, you know, that those are the relationships that sustained me and, 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 and motivated me and, and encouraged me to, to continue on. And then there was a type of, duping and that and and another interesting thing i think that connects to what you were saying dave about theory underground and and what we're trying to open up there is um you know that when mikey and doug had that relationship they they didn't have an ideological synergy you know like they had ideological differences you know i you know Doug was interested in X, Y, and Z, and Mikey was interested in A, B, and C. And, no. you know, that's okay. You know, we can have those ideological differences. It's, it's, it's okay. I, I, you know, you can be interested in Wittgenstein. I can be interested in Deleuze. And, you know, we're both the richer for it. You yeah. know, and, and I think opening up those spaces is, is just so important. And I, I also appreciated the way you guys articulated the importance of symbolic fiction and duping and lack. I think that's all absolutely central. And I think that that also brings us to perhaps uh, our main topic, which, which is yeah. from philosophy, we come to Zizek. You know, Slavoj oh, Zizek, no. I think certainly for people who, who listen to my channel, they'll be obviously aware of 
Slavoj Žižek's work, but you know, uh, why why Slavoj Žižek and why teaching specifically an introduction to for they know not what they do? Why that book? Okay. I want to let Mikey. Oh, I want to let you. I want to let you take this away, Mikey. But I want to preface what you're going to say. Uh, because I want to say that on the theory underground YouTube, as well as a uh, podcast, because we want to be accessible to working people, uh, we've broken down the last few years of our conversations on introduction to Lacan and uh, Zizek's theory of ideology. And those are currently both, if you go to the, the main page of the Theory Underground YouTube, you'll see two playlists there. One is called Lacan 101. The other is called Zizek 101. And each of these episodes is broken up into like 20 to 30 minutes. And I mean, on average, and they have, uh, you know, titles about whatever concepts we're dealing with primarily in that section. And so I, I, this has been an ongoing thing already, but we've never just dived into one of the primary texts of these thinkers in public. We've done it. We did sublime object of ideology together in a course with uh, Peter Rollins, which was awesome. Sure. And uh, we love that guy. And uh, we've, we've also done some Lacan seminars privately, not live, before we ever did any of this stuff that's now public. But uh, this will be the first time that we're going to one of the primary pure theory texts. And so all I want to say is as far as Zizek stuff goes, it, there's a few of those texts where it's like, this is the good stuff. This is the pure, pure. This is the uncut. This is the, I want it. And that's the old it. barrels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the end, I think in the end, Mikey's reference to Jay-Z is here relevant because we got the good stuff. I mean, we're, you know, <laughs> We are concept, what is it, what's dealers? Yes. Yeah, and, I love uh, it. I love it. And and this is this is the pure pure. Yeah. Uh, I, just so you know, Mikey is silent. This <laughs> is a highly Bob. refined concept. I'm Jay. Mikey's silent Bob. That should be everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I talk a lot. Yeah, so. Ma- Mikey's not doing a good job of being silent Bob. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta Although say. Dave, like I, I the last week or so i've seen dave on different streams talking about lacan and i'm like i really can just become silent bob he's absorbed so much i don't i don't need to teach this shit anymore i'll just let dave talk Going but, back. Uh, all right so let, let's 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 bring it let's bring it back in so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you guys are teaching on zizek why zizek you guys are teaching on for they know not what they do a lot of people even if they know zizek they might not have ever heard of that text yeah you know so so why that text and and set it up here Okay, so I also am guilty of putting this text on the back burner. So, and part of it, there, there's a couple of reasons why. There's a, a documentary that's just called Zizek, right? It came out, I don't know, 2005, somewhere around there. I think it's before his, his first film with Sophie Fine's uh, Pervert's Guide to Cinema. I believe it's before that. And there's this clip in it where... Slavoj says what his, in his opinion, his four most important books are, at least up to that point. And so he says it's the, the, the serious work is Sublime Object, Tearing with the Negative, Tickless Subject, and Parallax View. Now, we know that less than nothing would come along later, and it's going to be known as his, his masterpiece, which you have taught in-depthly. Uh, but... Um, Okay, so because of what Slavoj said there, I just, and the other thing with For They Know Not What They Do, I knew that it was just lectures that he had given that had been turned into a book. And so I just thought it was kind of supplemental. I'd read a little bit here and there of it on various concepts or whatever, but I had never really sat down and read it from cover to cover. Well, rewind about six months, uh, Michael at the Zizek and so on podcast organizes a, a lecture, uh, lecture series um, or an entire course on where they know not what they do taught by Matthew Flissfader. And if you know anything about Zizek studies or whatever, Matthew is one of the, the premier Zizekian philosophers. He's written a really important book called Al- Algorithmic Desire. It's a kind of Lacanian Zizekian analysis of social media and everything. And so 
me and Dave and the rest of the young Zizekians, it's our little group of friends, uh, Andrew and Nick, right? They're, they also took, so the four of us take the course and it became immediately apparent to us how rich this text really is, how important it is. And that, like I sat there the first couple of weeks just going, why the hell did I not read this sooner? And it, we started to all, the four of us especially started to have these great conversations about it and kept having great conversations about it. The text has so much to give. And once the, the course was over, we just kept talking about it. And Dave and I are like, we need to just keep this going. And so Dave was gearing up, you know, to teach. And we had talked about me teaching for a long time. So it was just really, it just worked out that way. But the, okay, so the reason though, I think this text is so important is that I think even more than less than nothing, I think it's, I think it's the text in Zizek's work that is the most concentrated conceptually speaking. One of the issues with Slavoj is that he's one of these great philosophers of examples. He will give you a million examples, sometimes even to his detriment, where He'll give you so many examples that it kind of blurs the point together and you're, you, you work through them and you're like, what was the point again? Right. And so sometimes like this, like I'm, I love his examples, but then other times he'll, he'll, he'll start making a point and then he'll give three or four examples and you don't see how they connect. And then he's off to make it another point and it ends up leaving you feeling like he's doing philosophical vignettes where it's just, they're unconnected. And he's just doing these little short analyses of pop culture or whatever. And what it does is it actually obfuscates the overarching theory that he's developing throughout the whole book. And I think for They Know Not What They Do is the best book to get the overarching theory, at least early on in his work, because there's not that many examples. And when there are examples, they don't muddy the water in the way that they sometimes they do right like i've heard people say oh well you know looking awry is the best book to give somebody new to zizek and looking awry is one of his other early works and it's you know jock lacan through hollywood and pop culture right so really what it is is he's introducing lacanian concepts but through primarily the works of alfred hitchcock but the problem is if you're not familiar with hitchcock's films you're lost, right? So this thing that's intended to be accessible and introductory, it ends up becoming a homework assignment because you're like, do I have to go watch every fucking movie Hitchcock made to understand what's going on here? And that's what I love about where they know not what they do. The examples actually don't get in the way. And it's like he's just doing concentrated theory. And so the thing that at first I thought was its detriment or its lack, like, oh, he just threw these lectures together they're not like his serious worked out text. No, the very fact that he threw lectures like this together for students um, that were uh, up high in you know, known theory, right? It, it made him where he just kept it straight to the, the, the Hegelian points, the Lacanian points. And so honestly, I think even over Sublime Object, it is just pure Zizekian theory in a concentrated form. And that's what makes the book so good. All right. So, I mean, one of the interesting things here is, is, you know, you, you put the book in the conversation with, you know, let's say the sublime object or less than nothing in your experience, what do you think is the relationship between Zizek's early work and his, his late work? Um, you know, what, what's, what separates his early work and his late work? Cause one of the things that, that struck me upon, you know, reading for, they know not what they do for the first time was um, it was so interesting to see how many themes that he does talk about in less than nothing or absolute recoil are coming up in 1992. So there's there's such a deep continuity in his work as well. You know, he might have, you know, have have maybe used different examples or maybe, you know, cite different texts or something like that. But there is this deep continuity there, you know, between his early and late work. What, what do you think's going on there in his, you know, so different phases? For me, yeah, for me, I honestly, I don't really even think of him having phases, to be honest. Not, not, in, not in the way that there's early and late Heidegger or early and late Wittgenstein or 
like Lacan's periodization of like, okay, before he really started the seminar, he's, he's doing the work on the imaginary. The first, uh, the first six years of the seminar, he's primarily focused on the symbolic register. And then from seminar seven all the way up, he's working on, well, at least from, let's say, seven to, I don't know, 20. It's primarily the, the work in the real register. And then he gets really interested in the knots, right? Point is, though, with Zizek, I just don't see this kind of periodization coming through. I just see him, and I mean, he said this himself. He's just been trying to write the same book about Lacan and Hegel in, in different ways since day one. And I mean, even the, the, the his book before Sublime Object that he wrote in Slovene, um, Most Sublime Hysteric, which it's been translated now. And I've been reading that one too. And it is it really is a great supplement to For They Know Not What They Do and a Sublime Object because there's lines of thought he's he's laid the foundation for in Most Sublime Hysteric that he's going to develop in both Sublime Object and in For They Know Not What They Do. But for me, I, don't, I, I, I guess maybe you can say as Zizek moves along, like early on, he is primarily focused on the Hegelian or the, the Lacanian side of his thought. Hegel's always there. He's most there and for they know not what they do. And I think that's one of the other book, great merits of the book. But there does come a point, especially like with less than nothing. And then he really knows that it's time. He's getting older and he's like, I, I really want to do the work on Hegel. And there's more work on Hegel later on. But I don't see that as like a, a break or a cut in um, in his in his conceptualization or his concept matrix. It's more a shift in emphasis. But still, even then, it's like Lacan is still omnipresent. It's just there's more of like, OK, I, I really want to do more with Hegel now. I, I think that's such an interesting point, though. And I'd even want to like maybe go into that a little bit because you know, it's the thing that actually strikes me um, the most in terms of um, not not even necessarily for they know not what they do in less than nothing, but there is this way in which there is a slightly an accent on Lacan in the early early texts, and especially in the later texts. Like I would say, I, I would say not. I would say even in less than nothing, there is an accent on Lacan because he'll do Hegel first, Lacan second. And, you know, now we're going in deeper into the thing in itself. And in absolute recoil, I think there's maybe a flip where oh the accent cool. goes to Hegel and mm -hmm. that accent gets more and more pronounced. Like, like, for example, it's to me, it's super obvious in a, in a book like uh, Surplus Enjoyment or something like that, where the accent is going towards a historicization of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and yeah. stuff like this, but I'd be interested to know, like, you know, what what you make of this accent flip or this, you know, potential relationship between the two. I mean, I've just, I've just I've seen him say it himself that you know his, his first love, philosophically speaking, is Hegel, and he, he's never denied that. And I think on some level, part of him feels like I didn't write. I didn't write the Hegel book, even with less than nothing, even with absolute recall. Like, I mean, I think we all sit here and go, wouldn't it have been amazing if he could have written like a line by line commentary on sublime or uh, on phenomenology of spirit or science of logic. And he's just not going to write that kind of book. I wish he did. I think um, it would be the equivalent of asking him to be an analyst. Like, you know, exactly. I talk too much, you know, like, <laughs> yeah expect me to just stay on topic and, and what are you talking about right and so, stay on and, point and, yeah yeah and you know That's what here's the thing i don't good. i want to be fair it's mm -hmm. not i think he does stay on point much more than people give him credit but it doesn't seem like he does and he does wander about trying to develop the concepts i think there's conceptual compatibility and consistency between the concepts but he's kind of a wanderer in that sense and I think the idea of just trying to write a line by line commentary or, or something akin to that, where it's just, I'm just sticking straight to the text. I think it's always going to be something that those of us who love Zizek's work, we're always going to view it as a kind of missed encounter. Like, why couldn't he have just focused on writing a commentary 
of any kind on either of Hegel's main two books, but you know, it's, it's also a, a tall task. I mean, who, who, who's the guy who did it? Terry Pinker didn't, isn't he the one who wrote the, the two volume commentary on science and logic? I'm ac- I'm actually not sure. Okay. I think I have them over there. I think, um, I think this is the part, this is the part though, where we bring in the fic, the Fictian and Stas, right? Oh, you mean that his, Zizek's style and approach to writing is both its condition of possibility and its condition of impossibility. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I, so Todd McGowan has, has really done a lot um, to connect Fichte's concept of Anstos to Lacan's concept of objet petit a. I mean, Slavoj sees this, but Todd's better at connecting these dots. I think Slavoj kind of mentions it in passing at one point, but so the Anstos is is defined by Fichte as the thing that is both the impediment and the uh, the motor. Like it's the thing that gets the thing moving, but it's also the thing that prevents it from operating at one hundred percent capacity. So um, impediment uh, and and driving force, right? Um, obstacle and motor. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, but you brought it up at the very beginning of our Zizek 101 right, as, yeah. Jody, as Jody Dean's example, uh, or or she says that the Fichtean, there's a Fichtean Anstos to Slavoj's style. It allows him oh. to write, but it also gets in his way because this is why he doesn't have, say, what we we're talking about, a commentary, right? Because yeah. his his very uh, his style that allows him to do what he does, and in, in it, which is no one else has done, is also in, in getting in the way of of us getting this thing here that we want. But and hey, it's, it's, similar. Frustrating, it's frustrating our desire though. So we like it. Right, but it, it's similar to musicians, right? If you t- said, hey, Eddie Van Halen, that's really great what you do with the electric guitar, but can you shift and be just as great in classical music or experimental jazz? He, I mean, <laughs> maybe he could, but the, I'm just mm-hmm. making the point that his the, the style allows your content. It allows you to do what you're doing. And... Slavoj's ability to do the theory he has has been driven by his he, he's got these laser sharp and quick connections but be, between pop culture and theory and all this and if we were to try to say no 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 write in an entirely different way I'm not sure we I mean we get anything like I don't think there's a disconnect between his his content of what he's saying and the, his style I think the form and the content facilitate each other um and and you could probably make that argument for the vast majority of philosophers right um if, if you try to tell heidegger to write tell heidegger to write like slavoy like no, he's not going to write about the, being that way this is the right. argument which i think i think okay. telling heidegger to write like Zizek would probably be like a, a good example of his <laughs> personal nightmare right, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, just kill goodness. me yeah, yeah did you want to say something there dave yeah, chapter chapter one of my book is about about how Heidegger's form matches his content and proves his point that he's trying to make about language and meaning in being in time. And so, oh. and I, and at the end of it, because when I wrote it, I hadn't read a lot of these other people. I say I don't really know if this argument applies to anyone else, and nobody should use it as their own ex, as an excuse to write like this. But in his case, it's actually necessary. Like what he's talking about, you know, and we could get into it one of these times but it's, no, I, I want to say just to back you up on that point i mean this is like if you read heidegger scholarship one of the the great heidegger scholars is richard Kappa bianco and mm-hmm. richard is very much tapped in to the the later heidegger who's about the gleaming of nature and how fusis unconceals itself right this is a different heidegger than we have in being in time that's focused on these existential issues and all that and what you find is you can go watch Richard lecture on the later Heidegger on on YouTube videos and Richard's very calm meditative approach to talking about Heidegger very slowly, very methodically, very calmly, right? That's tapped into the very thought itself. Like Heidegger would not have written what he wrote if he wasn't taking these slow walks through the black forest and going back to his little cabin where he could quietly soak in the evening and as it falls upon 
the, the little pastoral view and like and, and Zizek couldn't write what if he's not absorbing pop culture and you know, all this so you see how like the life world of a philosopher really does affect what they write what they're what they're interested in and for me like it's hard for me to be tapped into the gleaming of nature that heidegger was talking about in the black forest in my rotted out suburb in america like I, i'm going to talk about different things right and that's fine that's one of the great things that's why i want different philosophers from different backgrounds and who, who come from different cultures to to get to write because you're going to get different takes on the world that way um like i mean I, like, heidegger didn't says, know that kansas doesn't glean just the, there's just no, 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 no gleaning. Sir. going. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm in Missouri, sir. <laughs> no, it's, I'm joking. Like, no, it's a, it's a little rivalry. Can't it's Kansas city. Everything that makes Kansas city, Kansas city is in Kansas city, Missouri. But of course, everybody thinks Kansas city is in Kansas for obvious reasons, but it's a joke with all of us. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody thinks that our city's in your state, but all the good stuff's in our state, but that's, it's just local bullshit um <laughs> but no i mean th that is that that's part of it and i mean when heidegger says language is the house of being right i mean my friends who have grown up and, and been able to learn different languages i have a friend who got to learn arabic the first thing she told me after i i hadn't seen her in a long time i go so you speak arabic now how what is that and she goes it's like walking into another world is how she put it and that always stuck with me and that that's where you can see like language because of its finitude because language is limited each each language can show you things that other languages can't show you but it can also conceal things it's not able todd mcgowan pointed this out in a recent interview dave and i had with him where in english we can make this distinction between the general and the universal where they're not the same they're, they're getting at different aspects of society whereas in German, Hegel wasn't able to make that distinction because there's only one word for both of them, basically. I forget the German word, Todd knew it, of course. But um, this is where you see that the finitude or the, the limitation of a language, it, it can it can affect how you see things philosophically. I mean, Nietzsche was really great on this stuff too. He, he, he knew this all too well. So um, yeah, but okay, to bring it back to, so why, why Zizek? I think the reason it's so important to read Zizek the way we're going to read Zizek is because he's so often misunderstood. And, and Michael at the Zizek and so on podcast, he asked me, what do I think is the biggest misconception about Zizek's work, right? And I told him it's the biggest misconception about Zizek's work is Zizek's work itself. It's not a specific aspect of it or a specific concept. It's how people think about his work in general. And the problem is they write him off as funny or you know, the whole Elvis of cultural theory shit. Um, he's anecdotal. There's no real robust theory there. It's just like entertainment philosophy, something like that. And what I'm going to try to show um, with this course is that no, Zizek is a very serious philosopher. Um, I think Zizek's one of the great philosophers. I really do. I think it's going to take a long time for people to get past some of the shit. You know, people disagree, dis disagree with him on political takes or you have all these takedown articles or people don't read him the way they sit down and read Lacan and Deleuze and Levinas and Heidegger. And so they'll read him real quick and go, oh yeah, that was cute. Okay. But I, what I'm trying to facilitate and what Dave's trying to facilitate too is where we're trying to do our part to get people to read him seriously and to read his texts the way they would read difference and repetition or being in time or being in nothingness or of grammatology where no, it's, it requires that same kind of dedication and focus. And I think Slavoj's longest lasting contribution to philosophy is going to be his reading of Hegel and his Hegelian ontology. And that's exactly what nobody really talk. I mean, you talk about it, right? That's, I mean, you focus on it and like that, that's your, your, your great philosophical symbolic mandate is to champion this Zizekian ontology and all of its robust, you know, robust contribution to, to philosophy. But 
most of people who are into Zizek, you know damn well, better than we do probably even, because you, you've been dealing with this in a way longer than we have, that they do not take him seriously as like a serious philosopher doing ontology. It's so and, weird, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. No, I want to hear so, it, it, No, it, it, is, it is so weird. And, and maybe it's because I'm... You know, I, I'm 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 an outsider coming to philosophy in in many ways, but like, you know, I I mean, whenever I took on an intellectual project, um, from the time I started, you know, having my own sort of philosophical or let's say broadly academic or intellectual interests, you know, I only studied something if I was, you know, so to speak, taking it seriously. Uh, you know, I was first into the evolution evolutionary sciences and stuff like that. But as soon as I encountered Zizek. Even though I first encountered him, like, you know, watching, you know, the uh, pervert's guide and uh, seeing some some lectures on YouTube and stuff like that, it, it always struck me like I never had the reaction of this guy's just entertainment. Like I knew it was entertaining, but I, I never reduced it to just entertainment. Yeah. I always my fundamental first thought. Here's my fundamental first thought was and this was just about when I was about to start my doctorate was this guy can think in a way that I can't think yeah, there's, totally. there's some, there's something, there's something, there's a, there's a method like my, my and th that was my intuition. And the intuition turned out to be right. Was there's a method he has of thought that I haven't learned yet. And, yep. and, and, and I need to figure out what this method is. And so, so then you get into the Hegelian dialectics and stuff like that. And the, just the point I'd like to throw, throw back about, you know, because I think it's an important topic to dive deep on a little bit is, you know, Zizek's lasting contribution, perhaps being his his revival of Hegelian ontology in the end, is that, you know, in, in some sense, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but in some sense, when we think about postmodern philosophy, a, a lot of it is this hyper focus on epistemology and this, in some sense, severing between epistemology and ontology. You know, like this comes up in gender theory. This comes up in a lot of, you know, in, in a lot of different social theories. Um, but there's almost this, like, this loss of, of any philosophical relationship to ontology. And actually, what happened was is that ontology got sort of picked up by the hard sciences, and they thought, well, we don't need philosophy. We can just do quantum physics. We can just do evolutionary science, and we don't need philosophy anymore. You yeah. know, and that, that actually originally informed my direction at university. Because I was always kind of, I guess I was, you know, looking back on it, I guess I was always kind of interested in the ontological dimension. And one of the things I really appreciated in Zizek from the beginning was, and he made it clear in, in books like Less Than Nothing, is no, I'm 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 a serious thinker who's approaching, I'm not, I'm willing to jump in and talk about quantum physics. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. and I really appreciate that. So, so, you know, what, what in with your background in philosophy being so deep and rich and having read a lot of um, perhaps what's labeled postmodern philosophy, what do you make of this relationship between epistemology and ontology? What do you think is going on here? No, I think it's really good. And I mean, I, and maybe this is where you see my background in philosophy come up where to me, I don't think you can separate epistemology and, an onto and ontology. If you're saying, and I you think that's something. Hegel's message. Yeah, but I, but here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing. Even if you separate them, right? Even if you do the Kantian thing and say the thing in itself is inaccessible, we can only know the phenomenal world. He is still doing ontology. He's still bringing out the consequences of if reality is like this, which means we can't know it in it of itself. Then knowledge has to be limited to this. He's still thinking epistemology and ontology together. Descartes doing the same thing. Like, like, that's the whole point is I can only know something if I reach an ontological foundation. I think, therefore, I am, okay, the, the ontological foundation, that which I'm sure about when it comes to being is myself as a thinking subject because I can only be or I can only be deceived if I exist. So I've reached this ontological criterion. Now I can start to build out epistemological criteria off this ontological foundation. I just, and, and, and I mean, to go back to Doug's influence on me, one of his favorite philosophers is Charles Sanders Peirce, and Peirce was always emphasizing, like, you, the choice is not between having metaphysics and no metaphysics. The choice is between good metaphysics and bad metaphysics, and I, I just wholeheartedly agree with Peirce and this whole, if we call it the modernist tradition, where epistemology and ontology go hand in hand. Now, if we get to the postmodern thing, and again, I, all right, personally speaking, I'm kind of 
like I don't have a problem with talking about existentialism and lumping Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Heidegger and Sartre together, right? Despite their differences, I see how there's thematic consistency between them, even though Kierkegaard is like a, a you know, washed in the blood Christian and Nietzsche is an atheist and Sartre's an atheist, it doesn't matter. Like thematically, there's this, they're, they're both, all of them are focused on what it means to be the existing subject the, in a world in, in some way, shape or form. When it comes to post-structuralism or post-modernism, I, I think I just like the term post-modernism even more, but okay. The thing is trying to act like there's like some real, like, I guess what I'm saying is Deleuze and Derrida and Leotard and Baudrillard and Foucault, these, these guys are so rich in their own discourses or in their own thought. Like somebody could say, well, yeah, but they all privilege difference. Okay. I mean, yeah, in a way, but I feel like all that hinders almost our understanding of what each of them were doing. Now, is it true that like with Foucault or with Derrida that we get this idea of like, okay, well, meaning isn't stable and it's always in some way, you know, relative, you have epistemes, you have different, yeah, to some degree. And, and, and well, just one sec. Yeah. I it, Zizek, Zizek himself, um, when he frames his work in relationship to the contemporary field, will label he'll specifically like label Derrida and Foucault in the camp of what he calls a discursive historicism. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. But I mean, here, here's the thing, though, even even if even I guess what I'm trying to say is even if it's a negative relationship, they still have to think ontology and epistemology in some sort of connection with each other, even if it's negative. That if, if you know, okay, if if discourse, if a, if a store-sized discourse makes it where none of us are really getting at the thing in itself, uh, then, then that has like that ontological consequence to it, right? It, it's still connected, but if if the cynical thing is like okay, so we just have to resign ourselves to um, to just focusing on language or discursive structures, then the problem is you're going to continue to be metaphysical at an ontological level. It's not going away, and you're still going to make metaphysical judgments, even if you're trying to avoid that kind of thing. And so. For, I guess for me, I just think there's a certain disavow that you're just go ahead, Dave, put your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, jump in here. I think what Mikey's trying to say is that postmodernism is an excuse for not thinking through fundamental problems or concepts or the specific standpoints developed by great thinkers. It's a way of lumping a bunch of people up into some like idea and then basically disregarding all of their concepts and just saying, okay, so we either, we either know what absolute reality is, we have access to objective truth, or there's this postmodernism thing and they don't believe in that stuff. And it's just like, this is, it's a false framework being imposed Absolutely. by ideology, being imposed by ideology. And the only reason it's kept alive is because it's convenient for the conference journal circuit in academia. Yeah. Because people don't have to know thinkers and engage with other people through other thinkers and texts. They get to just say, oh, it's this ism. And then they judge people on the basis of, is this person sufficiently or insufficiently matching up to the criteria we've established for this ism? It's ideology, it's not theory at all. And so we fucking and hate that shit, yeah. Yeah, and to piggyback off that, if that's how we're talking about postmodernism, then I don't think Baudrillard, Foucault, Derrida, no, we don't. We don't have to use that term if it if it if it's too. No, complicated. no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not yeah. yeah, I'm not giving you shit. I'm. I'm saying like. I'm how, sorry. No, I'm not talking about you, Cadell. That's no, no, I, but no, but no. I, I, I feel, I feel you guys on 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 the way in which postmodernism can be used in this way as as some sort of 
negative reference point, which captures a group of thinkers, which you just don't want to read or you don't want to engage with. And, and I, I don't think that's really um, helpful. Like, um, yeah, I mean, Stephen Hicks, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely, or, you know, I, I would say like the way Jordan Peterson uses the term postmodernism is just, it's actually a detriment to the discourse of our time and, 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 and things like this. So yeah. no, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to use it in 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 that way. I just wanted to sort of approach. You know what's really going on more less than talking about postmodern. Well, I mean, well, Zizek will bring up the term postmodernism as well, and, that's and, what I and want to use say. it like yeah, this. Yeah. But I what I really want to bring up is why is it that Zizek is the like? Because I agree with you, Mikey and and Dave. You know, Zizek is the philosopher of our. I the way I conceptualize it is Zizek will be in that lineage of historical philosophers and. You know, specifically, he speaks to the post Cold War neoliberal era. You know that he he was the philosopher of, of this moment, and and maybe that moment is now passing, and and we're gonna we're gonna need to sublate Zizek and work with Zizek to to to, to understand you know the next step. But you know, what is it that Zizek is doing, which you know, a lot of other twentieth century philosophy isn't doing? You know, is it that you know one of the ideas I've had is that when you think of thinkers like a Nietzsche or a Derrida or a Heidegger, there is this relationship to ontology which is destructive or deconstructive. Like, like, like Heidegger will have this deconstructive ontology, you know, like Nietzsche will be, you know, going against Christianity in, an, in, a, in a deconstructive way. You know, there is this sort of, you know, I don't know, I'm just throwing this idea out there. I'm just trying to get at what is Zizek bringing? And when I read Zizek, it's like, He's like, try, he's like trying, he's always trying to like sublate the whole history of philosophy. It's like, no, 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 we got to still work through Plato. It's like, no, 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 we got to still work through Aristotle. No, 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 we got to still work through Descartes. 100%. And like, he'll make that point like that people who refer to Descartes or people who refer to Plato in just this simplistic negation without working through them are 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 the you know are 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 doing a disservice you know like and, and to mikey's point to the origin story of him as a philosopher you know goes to the bookstore and comes back home with plato and descartes no no it's good like, like you gotta work through these guys you know All right no it's okay here's what i think when it like why is slavoy important in this moment and also in the history of philosophy okay so here's what i'll say about and here i'm going to contradict postmodernism. All right let's let's okay if we take that as a milieu that was in france in the post-war era okay those group of thinkers are responding to different fields right the structuralism that was developed by saucer and claude levy strauss as applied so levy strauss applies saucerian linguistics to anthropology okay so they're all going to absorb saucer and levy strauss they're all going to, in some way, absorb what Lacan is doing with Freud, whether they really get it or not. OK, they're, they're going to have some sort of view on on that. They're going to have some sort of view on what Kojev was doing with Hegel. Right. Well, OK, now we're starting to actually put some meat on the bones of what was going on in that context. Now, on top of it, you had. Sartre, who had just become like a, a philosophical rock star in France with being in the existentialist and, you know, he's bringing in Heidegger. So there's this Heideggerian influence that's really going to impact Foucault and, and, and Derrida. So you have, a, 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 you have all these thinkers who are, they're dealing with existentialism, they're dealing with psychoanalysis, they're dealing with structuralism, and then the other big one, they're dealing with Marxism, right? Uh, especially the way that Althusser was rethinking Marx, right? So this is now starting to get into this context. And what they've, what, what I love about this moment is precisely this moment of deconstruction. And, and I'm using this in a broad sense. I'm, like, I'm using it from Heidegger up to Derrida and then applying it to all of them. What I find so admirable about what this group of French thinkers were doing, they really were, attacking the ideology of philosophy itself the the philosophy starting with plato and uh, socrates plato aristotle even the pre-socratics even with the fucking pre-socratics it starts with you're telling me this you're saying nature thank works you for shouting out the thank you for yes. fucking the the pre-socratics there 
Well, let's start with Thales. Like, let's let's take philosophy back to its first big name, Thales. What's the ideology? The ideology is that nature works in ways that are controlled by the gods, and the gods control it, and we don't know it, and we have to get it through religion in some way. And Thales goes, well, I look around, and I see, like, water really governs the physical world. Like, I see water and everything. Like, what if I can explain everything through water, through a natural element as opposed to spiritual supernatural forces right that very move he's critiquing ideology he's critiquing the presuppositions of his world and then socrates and all of all of them uh, pythagoras uh heraclitus parmenides all of them start getting tapped into this whole thing of like using reason and v- taking nature on its own and not making supernatural claims about it this is the origin of philosophy. And you see Socrates especially get into this whole thing about hysterization and questioning presuppositions. He, everybody he could talk to in Athens, he's asking them questions and hystericizing them and revealing to them that they've got basic presuppositions that they haven't thought through, that they take them for granted or they take them on the basis of authority. And so philosophy, I want to say, is it is dangerous. Like philosophy is arguably the most dangerous thing in the world because it will attack the most basic presuppositions of a given social order. And if you are in power or there's a certain power dynamic at play in that society and it's sustained by those presuppositions not being investigated, philosophy is the biggest threat to your society. And so it's no wonder, I mean, philosophers have always been celebrated so long as they were servants to the existing social order, if they were like apologists coming up with arguments in defense of it. But if a philosopher is sitting there going, no, I see all your bullshit and I'm going to start talking about it, they're a problem. Okay, well, throughout the history of Western metaphysics, starting with Plato and Aristotle, you get this thing called substance ontology, which is this idea that beings are primarily independent of each other. They are what they are in and of themselves. They have identifiable essences that make them what they are as independent beings and whether they're the platonic forms or whether they're embodied in particulars down here it doesn't matter the point is substance ontology and and it's it's basis in logic that a equals a i is i right that one thing is identical identical to itself right this is the law of identity you take this stuff and it after a while it just becomes the ideology of philosophy itself and what you get with the French, I mean, you get it starting with Heidegger. I mean, you especially get it with Hegel, right? You, but what the French really did is they said, well, okay, you, the whole history of philosophy is privileged identity. What if difference is, is undergirding or, or, or structuring identity? And all of them are going to do something different. And they get this from Saussure. Like, it, it's so funny that they get it from a linguist. But so Sir realizes like a sign within a sign system, which is to say a word within language, words only have meaning in relation to to other words. It's the differences between them that comprise their identity. And so if you take that linguistic insight about words and you start to ontologize it, well, now you're into a whole different terrain of metaphysics than the traditional Western all right. So let, let me let's let's jump off on that, because I think that's that's it's such a key point and, and, and worth going into. So, you know, so for for people listening, you know, what Mikey just said there was that, you know, you have basically the emergence of the ideal, the sort of the the reflexive identi- identification of the ideology of philosophy itself in this substance ontology whether it's a sort of naturalist or a platonic view, you have this sort of law of identity, which is uh, being privileged over difference. And, you know, the question I have in all this is that, you know, from a close reading of Hegel, it's clear that Hegel knew all this stuff and he understood the relationship between identity and difference. And what he does is he, I think he does two things. He tries to dialecticize identity and he tries to encourage people to work through identity, yep. you know, and, and with difference. And and now the thing is, is that what I always say is like, and you know, I even say like, you know, sometimes that what I'm trying to teach is not deconstructive, but rather uh, working through that we work through 
and yeah. and it what it what it implies what it implies what the working through implies is unfortunately a type of difficult labor and, and yeah. of the mind like you have to you know it's not gonna you can't just give this to you you have to go through it and what i mean by you have to go through it can be seen just in like you know uh in my view like you know when mikey or dave told their origin story if if i told my origin story as a thinker we had to spend a decade we had to spend 15 years working through you know you yeah. can't skip it you can't skip it you got to go, you got you got to go through it and 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 i think like here's what the what i want to throw out there is you know with this sort of what seems to me to be this like dialectical reversal between a substance ontology and a difference ontology we've lost the working through that's that's one of i i'm i'm not like wedded to that as an ideology but it's something that i'm bringing up sort of as something that has become meaningful for me as a teacher, uh, you know, in some of the work I've been doing. So, so what, you know, what, where does that lead uh, both you, Mikey and Dave? Well, I mean, look, I mean, just to piggyback off of what you said. So what, one of the great things that Slavoj brings to the table and he does it in for they know not what they do is he's thinking about Derrida's own critiques of Hegel because Derrida is going to lock Hegel into this tradition of substance and identity that ultimately all differences are neutralized or sublated within the ultimate identity. And so everything is captured in, you can almost say he's, for them, for, for Derrida, it's like Hegel's the, the thinker of identity par excellence. Now we know that's not right, but the the trick that, um, or it's not even the trick, the, the, but the trick to the argument or the Hegelian maneuver that Slavoj points out is like, look, Derrida, you're right. You're right about how when you start to investigate identity, you have to start going to things that aren't the thing. You have to do the difference, deferral onto the next thing and difference. You have to go to something that's different to be able to get the identity of the thing. You're absolutely right. But Hegel already did that. Hegel already figured that out. And he makes the second maneuver that you don't make, which is yes, mm -hmm identity breaks down into difference and that is identity he loops it back around in a way that says identity is the identity of identity and difference and this is the retroactive effect this is why for for slavoy retroactivity or quilting point which is this great lacanian concept is so central to the hegelian dialectic is that what happens at the end of a dialectical moment is a retroactive conversion that in some ways you don't even get something new. The newness appears in how the thing is retroactively understood in a new way. And that this retroactive conversion is this moment of dialectical um, sublation. And that that's what these, especially Derrida didn't get. Yes, things break down into difference, but that the, the way a thing differs from itself is essential to its very identity. And, and that's that's the Hegelian maneuver that Zizek sees in the dialect. Dave, what does this bring up for you? So it kind of ties together a bunch of things for me, but I, I don't, I, one of my big questions, I'm a baby Zizekian. I'm still learning Zizek from Mikey mostly. I've not done that much reading. I've read a couple of his books, you know, I read Sublime Object, you know, um, I read a couple of his more popular books or whatever, but I understand he's a, he was a Heideggerian. And so one of the things I want to hear from you both is how he's not or how he changes. But what I want to say about Heidegger is like when we're talking about substance ontology or uh, gosh, we've talked about a few things, but we were also talking about difficult writing itself. And I, I talked about how chapter one of my book deals with the way that his, his style itself proves the points that he's trying to make right? He's forcing breakdowns in meaning. And so the thing that I wanted to say about substance ontology and, and stuff is, that, you know, being in time, part of what it is, is it's a great critique of that. And it's one that really impacts everybody after him. Um, and so later Heidegger, I don't know. I don't know how influenced, I'm not that influenced by later Heidegger. I'm not, but the, the Heidegger who is deeply Husserlian, but now thinking about hermeneutics and philology and interpretation and everything like that. He, he does a deconstruction, but it's not just a deconstructivist deconstruction. He's just focused on saying, look, the subject-object divide, 
And so many of the things that these modern philosophers are all concerned with are on the other end of a whole set of things that are interconnected. And we can't think about these things separately. And analysis, concepts, science, logic, uh, everything uh, is on the other side of something that's being presupposed. We have to challenge these presuppositions by actually flushing out what is the interconnectedness before these divisions, right? And so um, the breakdowns in our life world throw us out of our ready to hand engagement absorbed in the world, right? That's the level of meaning, but we are broken out of that when things don't work out, right? And then we have to analyze what went wrong and try to work it out. So like if you're riding a bicycle and it breaks down, right? Suddenly you're thinking about it in a different frame, you know, you're, you're analyzing it, right? And so that's the level at which the science is developed. That's the level at which in space and time logic is derived, it seems. And so the being in the world is being presupposed. The equal primordiality of understanding your state of mind and discourse are being presupposed. Your being in the world is being presupposed, your existentiality. And so for me, like, I, I love the history of philosophy. I love, I love it all. And, uh, but, but Heidegger is very important. And I love to read all of these people as influenced by him. And so like, what are they doing with that? Because they've sublated, they've sublated him. Like all of these different mm -hmm. people sublated him in their own ways. And that's how I tend to approach a lot of them. But I don't know how to do that really with Heidegger. Or, or sorry, with uh, with Zizek, with his, uh, what what's Heideggerian about him? What was Heideggerian about him? So I'm curious what you both might know about that. I that's can jump, one of the big questions. I can jump in here. I can jump in here quick because I, I just had a conversation with, uh, as you know, Thomas Wynn on my my channel about Heidegger's Hegel. Um, and I actually picked up, I, I think we actually, we pushed some interesting ground in that conversation uh, that I'm, I'm going to bring up. But to your first question about, you know, what is it that's, let's say, anti-Heideggerian or, I mean, like in my view, in less than nothing, he tries to save Heidegger in some sense. But like, if there is an anti-Heideggerianism in Zizek, um, I would recommend this paper, he Hegel versus Heidegger um, by Zizek, where it seems to me like where, I, I'll link it to you, but it's, what? yeah, yeah, it's a great paper. But like, you know, what, what he clearly identifies there is, um, this idea that Dasein is like not sexual or not capable of thinking the real of jouissance. I don't know if that holds mm. up in, in your view, but that he's saying Heidegger can't think jouissance. No, and, he doesn't. and there's, and that there's no, and there's also no space in Heidegger for certain uh, psychological um, categories, which are essential for psychoanalysis, like uh, psychosis, like there's no psychotic subject in Heidegger, Heidegger and, and, and he'll say things like that. Um, but in terms of like, you know, what's, you know, what came up in the converse and then I'll pass it to Mikey, but what came, what came up in the conversation with, um, with Thomas Wynn, which I thought was helped me really deeply think the relationship between Heidegger and Hegel, because that's something I'm going to try and think in the science of logic course is that being in time is equal to Hegel's phenomenology of spirit in terms of questioning the presuppositions of our life world and working up to a standpoint of knowing in which we can engage, you know, logic and science in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, and, you know, and then he was making the point that Heidegger's next move to approach what is metaphysics is somewhat analogous to Hegel's move to, to approach science of logic because the science of logic is basically saying it's about metaphysics. Like it's basically saying logic is metaphysics. But now, but the difference that now why we could go on about what is the difference here between Hegel and Heidegger's project on this level, but um, just this point that there is some synergy or some overlap between Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and Heidegger's being in time and then moving to the question of metaphysics. And, and we could talk about, you know, what, you know, I mean, the, the, these are um, in some sense, two big questions to just do in a podcast. It'd be more like, Dave, when you do being in time course, 
and I'm doing science of logic course, this is a conversation for us to explore for years or something like that. That's probably the better level of the conversation. But mm -hmm. um, Mikey, what does this bring up for you? Okay, two things. So I haven't read this paper by Zizek. I really want to now, um, but I haven't read it yet. And so what I'm going to do, uh, two things. I, I'm actually going to read a paragraph that I just wrote yesterday. This is from this, I'm calling it a mega blog post. It's really a book. And I, I'm writing this primarily for Dave. This is something I have wanted to, it's almost like a philosophical letter. Like I've wanted to ex say all this stuff to Dave for like two years about Lacan and Lacanian psychoanalysis and how it connects to Marxism. And then what I have to say about Deleuze and Guattari. And then what I have to say about the superego. It's a, it's like, it's, it's a book without a thesis. It's just pure cascading theory. And I think it's already about over, it's like 70,000 words long. It's a book, but mm -hmm. it's just me connecting dots. And so, like I say, it's primarily for Dave. I'd also say like, okay, it's also for Nick and Andrew, right? Because I think that a lot of this stuff's going to interest them. And it's, I mean, it's for whoever, but primarily I've always wanted to just say this stuff to Dave and I couldn't do it in a conversation. I, okay. But this is a little paragraph I just wrote and it's, crazy like what i'm saying here and what you just said slavoy says in the essay on hegel and heidegger so here's what i i say now lacan's concept of ontological guilt which is neurotic guilt is psychoanalytic but we find an existential concept of it in heidegger's being in time i see a lot of conceptual compatibility between lacan and heidegger despite the fact that lacan himself didn't see it since he himself said what does neurotic guilt consist in? It's truly stupefying that no analyst, not even any phenomenologist, mentions this essential dimension, articulates it, or makes a criterion of it. That's from Seminar 5. It's true that Heidegger was focused on existential guilt and not neurotic guilt, but Lacan should have recognized that Heidegger's phenomenology of Dasein's ontological guilt is actually a phenomenology of neurotic guilt since Dasein is proximally and for the most part neurotic. Hysterics and obsessionals have existential struggles in ways that psychotics and perverts don't. As opposed to the neurotics being in the world, psychotics are being out of the world or being out of the world in the world, whereas perverts are something like being kind of in the world or being half in the world. If read from a Lacanian perspective, I'd argue, get ready for it, that Heidegger provides a better Lacanian account of guilt than Lacan himself did. Of course, the one unphenomenon that Heidegger's existential phenomenology was unable to see was jouissance, but that's to be expected since jouissance is that which evades phenomenological description unless one already sees things through the concept of jouissance. Heidegger's phenomenal maxim went like this, before words, before expressions, always the phenomena first, and then concepts. That's from the History of the Concept of Time, page 248. It was in holding tight to this principle that Heidegger remained blind to jouissance. When it comes to spotting the enjoyment of the drive, always the concept first. Nevertheless, Heidegger's description of conscience and guilt is a psychoanalytic treasure trove. Okay. But I, it's weird. Like I'm seeing how in line I am with Slavoj, even though I haven't read that paper. I li I linked it there. I don't know. I'll, I'll put it in the the description. It's actually in the description of the the Heidegger's Hegel video with Thomas Wynn. But Dave, uh, did you want to sort yeah. of uh, what, what's coming to your head there? Well, I want to say a couple of things because I mean this is all well and good, but I think I'm a uh, Hegelian enough that I get to do what I want here and be. Heideggerian and Lacanian at the same time, because I can just sublate them into my own shit, you know? And so the, and they all do sublate him. So, you know, you, in a sense, they're all expansion packs on being in time. That's, you know, every one of these thinkers I think of as an expansion pack. And usually one that does something really cool and goes in a completely different direction, like Foucault, like all of Foucault's work is an expansion pack on being in time, you know? And you know, you, you get all of these fundamental critiques that can be summed up in nice pithy little things like, like Levinas says, Dasein doesn't eat soup. <laughs> Luz says- Lacan, Lacan says, uh, language is the torture house of being. Yeah. 
The con Lucy also says, says, eat your Dasein. Yeah, eat your Dasein. Loose Irigaray says, Dasein doesn't breathe, right? You could say, Dasein doesn't fuck. Dasein doesn't have death drive. Dasein doesn't have to OJ. Okay, fair enough. But what Dasein is, is a clearing within which all of these other projects unfold. And I love, I'm I, my three main are going to be taught in this order. It's being in time, totality, and infinity, das Kapital. And it's in that order for a lot of reasons. But if I just, I think that there's something very important that has to be thought through. And it's not a place to set up your little house and stay for the rest of your life, but you have to think through the, these chain of texts. And, uh, and so, uh, but no, I see Lacan and, 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 uh, Zizek uh, is totally compatible. I mean, obviously they might be big corrections. So for instance, Merleau-Ponty and Lacan both show how Heidegger never thought about childhood. Now that's very important, right? Absolutely important. And so Dave, you have to think about development and development is literally lacking. So, um, but the thing is, is thinking the world today and understanding these thinkers who are critiquing these people, Marx and Heidegger, we've got to we've got to kind of be able to live and breathe their texts. Think about specific passages of their works. You know, they're I, I see them as fellow travelers in the sense that they're indispensable. Totally, and I I love your project, and I'm gonna love to see how it unfolds. Um, my que my question to you is, and this is a serious question, is this question of design, like, and and it, this might like this question is sort of what's the back what's in the background of this question is perhaps, um, you know, questioning like the attacks on Heidegger in some sense, or like the interpretations of Heidegger in some sense is like that design's not a subject, right? Supposed to be, yes. Not like design's, does, does, design's not supposed to be a subject. So, I mean, if, you know, from that point of view, I mean, I mean, it kind of makes sense in some sense that design, you know, doesn't fuck or doesn't eat or doesn't breathe, it's not a subject. You know, what, what, do, what do you make of that? I don't want to take it, take us too far. But, you know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really I've heard design is like best thought of as like a thought experiment. <clears throat> it is. It is. And that's the case with every phenomenology. The phenomenology is not something to be taught as a dogma. It's something you're supposed to think through so you can see something in a way you've never thought about it before. And then you keep going. And that's Husserl would say that. Heidegger does say it repeatedly. He says it at least once in the history of the concept of time. I'm going to find that quote here in the next month and a half as I reread this. But, um, you know, he says that it's not something that you teach a bunch of like outcomes to somebody. It, it, the point is, is you go through the process and there, there's this philosophical bracketing effect that's going on, which is to say, we're just going to set aside a million questions and a lot of assumptions and look at something anew. We've been using a con we've been using concepts and definitions to argue about things analytically. Let's step back from all of that and think about a different point of departure into the fundamental questions. And if the fundamental question of philosophy is what is being, what we've been missing perhaps is the question like what is the meaning that is being posited or pre or presupposed whenever we start talking about what we think is real, right? Yeah. What, what, what's the motive of that in the first place, you know? And so the point of departure is instead of, you know, this rational. Well, I'll um, tell you the motive, you know, the motive, the, mo subject. the motive, the motive here is to get people in the four, they know not what they do course taught by Mike, Michael Downs and, and hosted by Theory Underground. And, and so bringing it back to, let, I will just quick bring it back to For They Know Not What They Do. So the, the, the subtitle, I think there's, this is a interesting question is the well, subtitle. Sub no, 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 actually, no, no, but I can pull it. I'm, I'm pulling it all together because I had like one okay. sentence left. So the point of departure for Dasein, if you're going to think through this though, is the point from which our being is an issue for us. Yeah. Right. And so this is why Lacan and Zizek are relevant. That can be our segue back to for they know not what they do in Heidegger's use of Hegel is and to it, think it, through our situation. So. All right. So in that, in that spirit, so like the, 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 and connect a little bit to the concept of jouissance as well, because 
the subtitle of For They Know Not What They Do is Enjoyment as a Political Factor. And that strikes me as an important subtitle. So maybe so like as a good way for us to sort of, you know, bring this conversation to, you know, um, I don't know, a, an integration or, or something like that, you know, maybe Mikey, also Dave, if you want to jump in, could you break down the title both for they know not what they do, what does that mean? And enjoyment as a political factor, what does that mean? What's Shizik trying to do there? And how are you going to try to teach that or bring that out, let's say? Sure. So as far as the for they know not what they do, this is actually something Christ said on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The way Zizek is going to use it, I mean, he, he explains this in Sublime Object, but he's going to always go back to this, is that ideology is actually in what you do. It's often, in, most often, in activities wherein you think you're behaving freely. And that in, in these acts where you take yourself to be behaving freely or you're freed from ideology, that's where you're at your most ideological. So in a sense, that's forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Forgive them for not knowing that they're being their most ideological where they think they're being their least ideological, right? The, the enjoyment as a political factor thing, now I should say, is state up front, this is not really the best book for Zizek on jouissance, on enjoyment. Um, he, he does it better in other books. And I don't know if I think it's a, it's a I don't, I, I'll just be honest, I don't think it's the best subtitle for this text. Because, I mean, if you think about what he does in the last chapter of Tearing with the Negative, where it's called Enjoying Your Nation as Yourself or enjoying your nation as once a uh, one enjoying it's something like that enjoying your nation that's where he lays out his whole thing about how ideology scapegoats the other and that when there's structural problems going wrong in a society there's always some sort of scapegoat figure whether it's immigrants or a racial minority or lgbtq there's always some scapegoat who's going to be blamed for causing the problems of a society where in truth, it's the society itself. It's structural, built-in contradictions or deadlocks within that society. So, but then to zoom out a little bit, jouissance shows itself and structures politics in so many ways. Now, Todd McGowan is especially great on this, but both Zizek and both McGowan are always bringing up like, why do authoritarian figures have so much charismatic trunk? Like, why do they, why are they so, why can they so easily seduce people into following them? Why does reactionary fascist or just proto-fascist politics seem to have an upper hand when it comes to mobilization than leftist politics, right? Um, why did the Soviet Union um, implode on itself? Or why, you know, Zizek's going to go through all of these you know, from the Stalinist show trials to consumer capitalism to anti-Semitism. And he's going to show how jouissance is structuring all of these ideological formations, right? And so one of Zizek's greatest contributions to ideology critique is that ideology for him is not merely something that exists at the level of meaning. It's not just bad concepts or what Marx called false consciousness. It's not just about conceptual distortions of one's social reality. That's there. He's not denying that. What he's going to go on and argue is that what keeps us hooked on these distortions, what keeps us hooked on these 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 false these these ideological distortions is the enjoyment we derive from them in various ways. And whether it's through the way we fantasize or whether it's our everyday forms of enjoyment or whatever, there's different aspects to our libidinal economies, as we call it. And, and he's going to show in various ways how fantasy is doing this, how drive is doing this, how desire is doing this. And he's going to show how ideological formations are held together by a primary signifier, what he calls the master signifier following Lacan. And what, he, what he's doing is he's given us all of these conceptual tools to understand 
political situations, ideological situations, cultural situations. And he's taking these concepts Lacan used in the clinic in dealing primarily with neurotic patients and showing how these actually can apply to the social field itself. And look, there's, there's a big tradition of like uh, Freudo Marxism where lots of thinkers, I mean, you think Herbert Marcuse and all these guys, but I don't think anybody <laughs> has pulled off a conceptual matrix comprised of psychoanalytic and Marxist ideas along with Hegelian ideas. I mean, the way that Slavoj's done it. And to me, I mean, it's, it's funny, Slavoj in an interview once was asked like, why did you go for Lacan? Well, why, why? And he was like, because Lacan, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, Lacan had the most explanatory power over Foucault, over Derrida, I could understand what was going on in my society better using Lacanian concepts than I could the other ones, especially when it comes to concrete political situations, right? And I feel the same way. Like, why Zizek? Because Lacan slash Zizek are able to give me conceptual tools to understand what's going on in my world better than the other great philosophers I could name. And part of that is idiosyncratic. Like, they clicked for me, and I'm not denying that. Um, but that, that's, that's why I'm, I'm going with them is because I get the most out of them. It's, it's, it's pretty simple, but, um, I, I mean, I'm, yeah, look, he goes into enjoyment a little bit in the last chapter of for they now not what they do. And we're definitely going to get into that. Um, it's just that when it comes to showing how enjoyment is a political factor, this isn't actually the best book where he does that. It's funny. Like he had this new book come out called surplus enjoyment and, it is not the best book of his to read to understand the concept of surplus enjoyment. That's just him and how he decides to title things and, you know, whatever. But I mean, we, but and so, sometimes it's not, get into the concept. sometimes it's not up to him. Like I know that sometimes the, the titles aren't up to him, like, but uh, the thing I wanted to, I, at least I think that that's true. I know that's true of his movies, but um, I wanted to suggest an alternative subtitle because you're, you've made a good case for why this is not a good subtitle. Um, and instead of enjoyment as a political factor, I was thinking it should have just been saving Hegel from the dustbin of, of history. Yeah, something like that. Like this, is his theore- this is his theoretical defense. He's saying, look, everyone's getting Hegel wrong. Let me lay out for you why I love Hegel. This is yeah. that book. This is that book. Yeah, I agree. No, and, but, but again, to go back to the whole thing, like, did he ever really write the book on Hegel? I mean, think about it. This book he's primarily focused on Derrida, right? Later on, like Deleuze doesn't even show up in this book yet. And you know, later on, Deleuze is going to become this big interlocutor that Slavoj is always going back and forth with. Um, I mean, you see it in Absolute Recoil. You see it in Less Than Nothing. You see it in Organs Without Bodies, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look on Deleuze. But like, there, it's not like, again, it's not like he goes, okay, what Derrida said about Hegel, here's my response. What Deleuze said about Hegel, here's my response. What Foucault, like he doesn't work systematically and it's spread out all across his work. And now somebody, like somebody could, if they if they wanted to do like the scholarly thing and edit together all these, pa- like it's almost like he gave the raw material. Dave, it's almost like our conversations. You go in and you snip it, you make them into snippets and you edit them like, if somebody was to go to Slavoj's work and go, let me try to form an overarching text comprised of the best arguments and statements or, or analyses on Hegel and how Hegel relate, like somebody could actually construct it. And I mean, that would be like an absolute task that a, a, like a great editor, editor should a, actually undertake because it would be an immense service for somebody to go through and edit it all together, right? Yeah, I mean, it could just be called Zizek's Hegel or something like that. Um, I, hope they de- I hope they dedicate it to you and put it up on Library Genesis. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, okay. The last thing I want to say just about why Zizek too. Now, this is a this is a philosophical thing where I just uh, this is something I agree with him on. One of the ways he differs from the main thinkers in that French post-war milieu. Most of them did reject the subject. That is a continuity. Like Derrida, Deleuze, Baudrillard, Foucault, Leotard, they did reject the subject. That is one commonality there. And so 
Zizek, along with Badu, they entered this new this new phase of philosophy where they came back and reasserted reasserted um, the subject. And for me, like that, simply put, I mean, just philosophically speaking, I think there's a subject. Now, what that has to be thought through is exactly what Dave was talking about. Like, I think if you're gonna argue in favor of the the existence of the subject, you have to go through Heidegger, you have to go through Derrida, you have to go through Deleuze, you have to take them seriously to understand how you can even justify holding to the, the notion of the subject. But I think that's another huge philosophical contribution on his part is trying to actually stand by and defend not only the subject, but the good old Cartesian subject that Descartes discovered in Meditations on First Philosophy. I mean, Zizek says that's what he's doing at the beginning of Ticklish Subject. And it's in understanding, here, here's what you have to take seriously. If you're gonna, if you're gonna say we're a subject, which is to say, I am not reducible to my social identity. There is some sort of pure self within me. I'm not saying it's a soul. I'm not saying it outlives the body. I'm not making those assertions. But I'm saying that there's some aspect of consciousness or even the unconscious that is a subject and it's not reducible to our, 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 our social positions, to the way our bodies look, where it's not reducible to that. You have to go through what Heidegger did with Dasein, where it's showing like, no, we are embedded in a world, which in Lacanian terms means we are always embedded in a symbolic order, right? Like, and this is the this is the structuralist dimension that. I don't like I I'm a structuralist in in a very specific sense which is to say I always am going to take structuralism seriously like I I see the validity of the concept of a of a social structure a linguistic structure etc structures are real like I I I I'm totally for that what happened when structuralism came along and the way that these french thinkers in their own ways interpreted structure is that the structure is like a kind of automaton, a, a kind of social machine that just reproduces itself. And like, we're not individual subjects. We're just almost puppets in a way. This is how Althusser also thought about. It. And we are, are reducible to the identities our social structures impose upon us, right? And that is not a stupid idea. That is, there's a lot of reasons to see that as being the case that our social network, our, our system of meaning it, it interpolates us, it, 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 it brands us in a sense, it gives us a social position in our society, class, race, gender, um, our, our pop culture preferences. It gives us a kind of prepackaged identity. And it seems like that's what we are, right? What is so important with what Zizek does in the critique of ideology using Lacan is to say, yes, we are social identities. That is an undeniable aspect of our reality, but we're also a real subject. There's a there's there's our social identities, and then there's our real subjectivity. And so he makes this distinction between our imaginary symbolic selves, so to speak, and our and the real subject who beneath them. And the point for him. In bringing back the subject, which is a totally negative subject, it doesn't have positive features. The abyss of Just freedom. Like, yeah, right, right. Because the Descartes abyssal subject, vortex. <laughs> yeah, like so for Descartes when he arrives, it's a Sartrean, the, right? Say what? Which is pretty Sartrean, right? Because when you let when you gave this list of the these guys who don't. Uh, use the subject anymore, you will have start off of it because obviously he still has got the subject going. And so Lacan's very influenced by that as well. But know? see, here's, but there, there's, this is this whole thing, right? So we're all working in, in the shadow of Marxism, existentialism, structuralism, and psychoanalysis. And my thing is, I think Zizek's done the best job so far of navigating these four discourses mm -hmm. And taking what's true in them and leaving behind what he doesn't think works. And so from structuralism, you just have to recognize that there are social structures that organize our world, right? Now, this is, 
I, I mean, I kind of see Heidegger as a kind of s structuralist. I know he's never listed in that in that intellectual milieu, but being in the world, saying that you know our Dasein is always worlded Dasein, it's to say that there is no Dasein without a symbolic order, right? Well, that sounds very Levi Straussian and Lacanian in a sense, right? Lacan's going to modify that though, and so. What, what we get with Lacan and what Zizek works out is you get structuralism with a subject. So Sartre would just kind of, like he was almost too Cartesian where you have a subject, but he doesn't take structure into account. It's like, I'm just pure freedom. Well, no, there are social structures in place that limit what we can do. Like you have to Calm take- Calm down, Sartre. Calm down, right, Sartre. Exactly. Just but <laughs> but it's also levi strauss it's like also you calm down bud like there's also a subject for sure for sure structure. But it, it's it's fun, funny funny you're you're setting that up because I, I i actually have a book that's coming out soon titled systems and subjects and right. it's oh, like i mean it's like it, yeah you got you got to think about this is the you think about in as a loop. like like it really is this is the zizekian in you where you're thinking like yeah there are systems but there's but that does not negate yeah, but also the subject and, and yeah and you got to and and but but i mean the thing is is that when you think like that you can think a lot of interesting things like you can go pretty far with with thinking in that way yeah. you know and, and, and anyway um no, don't what need to we get, get what we what we get is and this is lacan's great intervention this is why lacan will, or this is why Zizek will argue that lacan is not a post structuralist or post modernist right yeah because, because Lacan has this other register called the real. And most yeah. of the philosophers we're talking about are really just talking about the symbolic, maybe some with the imaginary. Right. They don't understand the real in the Lacanian it's sense. Such a good concept. And that's it. Like they don't understand this, this other dimension of, okay, there's what we see. That's our phenomenological experience, right? Like, and then there's how we see it, which is those are the structures or, or the systems of meaning, values that shape how we see what we see. But then there's what we don't see that structures what we see and how we see it. And that's the real. And this invisible factor that disrupts our world or structures it without us recognizing it as a structure, that is so important. And that's what these these other thinkers weren't tapped into in the way that Lacan was and for Zizek the subject itself is in the real and it's not it's not symbolic identity it's not our imaginary perceptual features our bodies the way we look etc it's this invisible and indivisible remainder right it's it's this negativity that is precisely because it is not its social identity, and that's the dialectical component of it. But Lacan would also call it, it extimacy, right? It's how the thing that I'm not is the thing that I am. And all right, well, if you're if you're interested in all of that, well, there's <laughs> well, there I, I got I got some good news for you. There, there, there's a course coming up, February 25th. That's that's five days from our recording, probably four days from this being posted live. For they know not what they do, taught by Michael Downs, David McCarricker, and hosted through Theory Underground. So, last words: Why should these people sign up for your course, Michael Downs, and why should they do it through Theory Underground, David McCarricker? Because I challenge them to come see if Slavoj is a serious philosopher or not. I would say because. We really, we got a lot out of the course that Zizek and so on put together and Matthew Flissfader. But when somebody asked the question about, um, could you kind of give like a quick run over of the different concepts that keep coming up here, like jouissance and objet and stuff like that. Um, the response, and this totally makes sense, was... Um, no, we 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 got to kind of assume that you've done that work already, and so that is a thing. That is the graduate level thing. If you there's there is a, a lot of people in these circles have been reading this stuff since they were teenagers, and now they're in their thirties, and they're way ahead of me or the person who asked that question. And so I'm sitting there like, I want that intro lecture though, and so that's what we're trying to do here. 
And so I think a lot of people probably find that relatable. We've got a lot of people signing up. We're very excited about this. It's going to be happening at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, which is what, like 4 p.m. Pacific Time, I believe. Yeah. And so um, it, it, what, would time, what time will that be for you, Cadell? I think it's 1 a.m. You're coming at 1 a.m.? No, I might, I might jump in for that. I might, I might just do the recordings, but I am signed up for oh. the course, and I'm excited to, to join in. And for those, for those days where I've had too many coffees, you might see me in the live. So. Well, uh, Mikey, you know, you know, Night of the World? Night, Night of the World. Right, right, Night of the World. There you go, right. Yeah, the, Night of the World signed up. And so. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm super excited. And, and like I said, for me, uh, you know, I, I probably, you know, I, I said to Mikey, actually, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you, when you come into a band late, you know, whatever album you, you listen to, you know, kind of becomes your, your favorite album. And, um, you know, for me coming into Zizek, I, I sort of focused on more of his later work than his early work. And so for me, you know, on a personal level, what I'm excited about to take this course is that I really get to go deep into some of Zizek's early work. And I get to, you know, for me, I'm going to be playing with, you know, what are the thematic connections and, and, and what, what has, what are the ideas that Zizek's been really you know, uh, playing with right from the beginning, you know, like, like, uh, like Mikey made that point, you know, like, you know, that Zizek has been writing a very, he's been trying to do a similar thing from the very beginning. And so I'm super excited um, to, to get a deeper dive into before they don't know what they do connected to sublime object and some of his later work. Um, so definitely uh, I would recommend any of you who are, um, on the edge, interested in getting involved, and maybe have never taken a philosophy class, or have met, or maybe never had the opportunity to take a, a philosophy class on Zizek. This is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I and it, you know, if you don't want to take the course, check out Theory Underground's YouTube channel and website. They've got other courses listed, and they've done some, like as already mentioned, they've got some uh, great overviews and introductions to Lacan's work, to Zizek's work um and 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 great live streams so check that out uh links will be in the description links to the course uh links to the blogs we've mentioned um so lots to explore lots of material um and, and thank you both for coming on and doing this conversation it was great to have you and, and great to uh great to have this dialogue thanks so much Cadell. it's been great seriously thank you all right peace out guys awesome have a good night